Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. I've been working on my HF transmitter project again, and in today's episode, I'm gonna show you a little module that I designed and built that includes the low pass filter, an antenna relay, and a directional coupler. Let's check it out. It's time to talk about what happens after the power amp, and until now, all that I've shown were the low pass filters connected to the antenna. In reality, there's a bit more happening here, so I've expanded the block diagram to add the missing detail. After the filter, I'm feeding the RF power through a directional coupler, which will provide two low voltage DC signals to the Arduino, one for the forward power and one for the reverse or reflected power. By using those two signals, I can calculate in software a moderately accurate reading of the transmitted RF power and the SWR. This is a very conventional approach that's used on many homebrew rigs and even some commercial equipment. Finally, after the directional coupler, I'm using a relay to switch the antenna connection between the transmitter and an external receiver, like the simple HF receiver I built a few months ago. That relay will be controlled by the Arduino in a timed sequence during the energizing and de-energizing of the transmitter. I'm packaging all three of these elements on a common circuit board that I'll refer to as the antenna module. For the directional coupler, I started with a design published by the OpenHP SDR project. You can find their work at openhpsdr.org. This project includes detailed designs for what they call the Alex module, which consists of transmit and receive bandpass filters. Now, integrated with the transmit filter is a commonly used directional coupler design for measuring the forward and the reflected RF power. Here's the schematic on page 30 of the Alex manual. The areas of interest are right here, beginning with the directional coupler, which is made from two ferrite toroids. Next, we have peak detectors made up of these diodes, caps, and resistors. Finally, these two op amps, along with the nearby diodes, resistors, and caps, provide some buffering, compensation for the voltage drop of the prior diodes, and some signal level shifting. Here's the full schematic of my antenna module that includes the low pass filter, the antenna relay, and the directional coupler. I'm building the directional coupler from two very common FT37-43 ferrite toroidal cores. Primaries are single turns, which means there's just a solid piece of copper wire passing through the center of the cores. Secondaries are multiple turns wound around the toroid. The number of turns determines the amount of isolation from the transmitted signal, and I'm showing a few examples here. I originally built the unit with 20 turns, but because of a mistake that I thought I'd made during construction, I did some rework and ended up reducing them to 18 turns, but the impact on isolation is negligible, barely a dB. Okay, so notice that the downstream circuit for processing the forward power signal is identical to the reverse power signal, so I'll only describe the forward path, starting with R9 and R11. These are two 100 ohm resistors connected in parallel to get the necessary 50 ohm impedance needed. There are also quarter watt through hole parts to provide plenty of heat dissipation capacity. Next we have D3 and C5, which make up a simple peak detector. R7 bleeds off the voltage from C5, and its value along with C5's value set the decay time constant for the peak detector. The signal then feeds into an LMC 6482 op amp. The 6482 is a good choice here because its output will go to the lower rail, which we need for dynamic range. Also, it can operate at 12 volts, which means it can use the transmitter's 12 volt DC supply bus without a dropping regulator, and it's available and it's inexpensive. Other than the 6482, there's likely many other op amps that would fit the bill. The overall requirements are pretty relaxed. The op amp is doing two things. It's buffering the signal from high impedance to low impedance, and it's adding back D3's voltage drop. That's why D2 is in the negative feedback loop. It compensates for D3's losses. All four diodes are 1N5711Ws, which are Schottky diodes and are a good choice to use here. Lastly, R3, R4, and C2 provide a low impedance to the op amp output and also provide a simple level shift and some filtering. The signals coming from H1 and H2 will ultimately end up at the Nano's analog inputs A6 and A7, where I'll be calculating transmit power and SWR in software. The rest of my schematic includes some filtering of the DC power before it goes to the 6482. It includes the modular low pass filter and the antenna relay. Oh, and there's this dashed line. This indicates that the ground plane is isolated between these sections. 
That's an idea that I got from K9IVB's version, and I'll talk more about that when I get to the board construction. Naturally, I decided to build an LT SPICE simulation of the directional coupler circuit, and here it is. And buckle in, guys, this is going to take a while. For the diodes, I'm using the parameter model from Diodes Incorporated. However, for the op amp, I'm just using the stock universal op amp model in LT SPICE. Now there is a model available for the LMC6482, but it must be very detailed because my simulation ran extremely slowly when I used it, so it must have been overkill, so I just replaced it with a simple op amp model, which is perfectly fine for what I'm doing here. I'm running a transient simulation of six different power inputs from 5 watts to 30 watts. I chose one millisecond as the duration because that's sufficient time for all the circuit voltages to reach about 1% of their steady state values. And even at one millisecond, the simulation still takes about 20 seconds to finish. Okay, so I use these measure statements to calculate various parameters during the final 10 microseconds. Then I manually copy and paste the results from the log file into Excel for further analysis. I adjust the value of R load to simulate various impedance mismatches. And yes, I'm limiting the simulation to just resistive mismatches, no inductors or capacitors. The main goal I'm trying to achieve here is to quantify basic accuracy of forward power, reverse power, and SWR calculations. And unfortunately, the simulation is indicating that the circuit design just doesn't work very well. Let's take a look at the results. Alright, so what I'm showing in this plot are the results of four different simulated load impedances from 25 ohms to 100 ohms. 50 ohms, of course, would be a perfect match to the 50 ohm output impedance of the power amp, so that's an SWR of 1.0. The three other values represent various load mismatches. The x-axis is power at the load, and the y-axis is the percent error in the calculated SWR as compared to the actual SWR based on the impedance ratios. At 50 ohms, it's spot on, but notice how crappy the error is for all other ratios, especially at low levels of power. It consistently underreports the SWR, and the error is very nonlinear. So if my simulation is correct, this circuit at best would provide only a rough indication of a mismatched antenna, and worst case might even be useless for, say, trying to adjust an antenna tuner to correct for the mismatch. Now to be fair, many commercial rigs don't display SWR with a high level of precision. And I got a couple of my rigs out here as examples. This Kenwood TS570S has a bar graph display with eight segments from an SWR of one to three. And my newer Yaesu uh, FT450D has a little more precision. It's got 15 bar graph segments over that same range. But if you look in the owner's manual for either one of these, there's no specification given for what the accuracy of that SWR reading is. So your guess is as good as mine. Nevertheless, I couldn't leave this issue alone and I decided I decided to study that circuit a bit further and see if I could find a way to improve it, and as it turns out, I did. I wanted to see if the output from the directional coupler was being simulated correctly. If it was, then the error would either be in the peak detector or downstream from it. So I zoomed in closely on several of the simulations and manually read the peaks of the forward and reverse voltages at those nodes here and here. Taking those peak values and plugging them into the SWR equation resulted in spot-on results. So the source of the error was definitely downstream from that point. To cut to the chase, the root cause for this error lies with how this circuit compensates for the diode voltage drop. Let me explain what I discovered, starting with taking a closer look at the diodes. Looking at the 1N5711 datasheet, we can see that the specs do show a voltage drop of 410 millivolts at 1 milliamp of forward current. And that's not bad. Your typical 1N4148 small signal silicon diode, for example, is around 700 millivolts at the same forward current. Now, in reality, the voltage drop is not fixed. It's a function of the forward current and a function of the ambient temperature. And I'll get into that more in a moment, but let's ignore it for now. So because of the inherent voltage drop in D3, the output of the peak detector circuit will never reach the exact peak voltage coming into it from the directional coupler. And that's where the op amp and D2 come into play. By adding D2 to the op amp's feedback loop, we're forcing the output of the op amp to be a diode drop higher than the inputs, thus restoring the loss suffered in D3. However, making the assumption that this circuit as designed will generate equal voltage drops across those two diodes is incorrect. And that's the root of the problem. The two voltage drops are not the same. 
In fact, the drops differ significantly and behave nonlinearly in the region we're using this circuit, and that's why we're seeing such large and nonlinear errors, especially at low transmitted power. To see why, we've got to go deeper than the data sheet and really take a close look at the forward voltage drop of a 1N5711 as a function of forward currents, especially those currents below a milliamp. Here I've built a new model where I've taken the diode parameters provided by Diodes Incorporated and just wired it in series to a variable current source. I'm sweeping this current source from 0 to 1 milliamp every microamp to generate a response curve. And here's what that data looks like, this blue curve. At 1 milliamp, the SPICE model shows a forward voltage drop of 426 millivolts, which is pretty close to the datasheet value of 410. Now, before I went any further, I decided to stimulate an actual diode and collect some real-world data. So this is the cute little test fixture that I whipped together. I'm using a 20K resistor in series with a 1N5711 and then carefully applying power while recording the forward current and the voltage drop. Here's what that data looks like, this orange response curve. It's the same shape, but shallower. And maybe the SPICE model is being conservative by predicting more voltage drop than actually occurs in production. But at any rate, this performance is close enough for me to continue. Let's return now to the full circuit simulation and examine the diode forward currents, specifically D4 and D1, the two in the reflected power leg. D4 may seem chaotic, but that's because it alternates between charging C6 and reverse leakage. The key observation is the peak current at steady state, which are these six peaks here. Remember that there are six curves because I'm simulating six power levels from 5 watts to 30 watts. Notice how much lower the current is in D1. In fact, it's about 40 times less on average. I can use the measure function in LT Spice to extract the actual peak values, which I've done, and then I've added that data to the diode response plot. Diode D4 is represented by the purple dots, and diode D1 by the blue dots. And now we can finally see why the error is occurring. D1 is just plain not compensating enough for the voltage drop in D4. I can do the same analysis for diodes D2 and D3 in the forward power leg, and here's what that looks like, these green and red dots. Notice the exact same problem. Ideally, and from a very simple perspective, we want all the blue dots to fall on top of the purple dots, and all the green dots to fall on top of the red dots. If they did, we'd have perfect compensation for the diode drop effect. So, how do we do that? One way to solve the problem is to adjust the circuit such that the peak currents in D2 and D3 match, and similarly in D1 and D4. Now, we wouldn't want to match all four. In fact, that would make the circuit not work because we're always going to have different currents between the forward power and reflected power legs. I could alter the currents in D3 and D4 by changing C5, C6, R7, and R8. But that would affect the time constant of the peak detector, and I'm not too crazy about that. A simpler change is just to alter R5 and R6. Their primary purpose is to sync current to ground for D1 and D2, so I'll go with that. Now they probably also impact the op-amp stability, but I'll worry about that later. So after some additional algebra, which I won't go through here because this video is already getting pretty long, I calculated what the ideal value should be for R5 and R6. And not surprisingly, there's not a common value. The problem is just too nonlinear. But it looks like using a standard value of 6.8k kind of splits the average, so let's rerun the sims with that. And bingo! That change pulled up significantly the currents going through D1 and D2, and now the red and green dots overlap nicely, and so do the blue and purple. Certainly not perfectly, but much better than where I started as you can see here as I toggle back and forth between the plots. Now let's rerun the various impedance mismatch sims and see the effect on the calculated SWR error. One side effect that I saw with using the 6.8K resistors is the SWR error at 50 ohms was now starting to creep up to several percent. So I made an in-game decision to bump them up to 10K for the rest of the sims. And here's the result. The model now predicts the SWR error to be within 10% or less across the range of power and a range of load mismatches up to 2.0. It still degrades the most at lower power, but 10% is a whole lot better than 25%. So at this point, it's time to shut down LT Spice and get busy building the module. This is it. It's 51 millimeters by 67 millimeters. On the bottom surface, I've placed the antenna relay, the through-hole components, and the two directional coupler transformers. 
Topside contains the surface mount stuff and most significantly the two sockets for the plug-in low pass filter. I need that accessible for easy band changes. You can see the split ground planes pretty clearly. As I said earlier, this was an idea used in K9IVB's design and it does make sense to me to keep the RF currents away from the analog circuit. Of course, they are at the same DC ground potential, I just connect them together elsewhere. Here's what a plug-in low pass filter looks like. They're about 51 millimeters by 18 millimeters and use a six pin and a five pin header for the connections. I'll cover the details about them in a future episode. And here's the final assembly. I did buy bare boards for these two guys. I do have to make several of the filters, so it made sense to have them fabbed. This one here is the filter for 40 meters. The other bands will look similar. Earlier I mentioned I'm using 18 turns instead of 20 turns on the toroids. Well, that's because I thought I messed up the board layout and had the coil winding directions backwards, so I had to unwind a couple of turns and cross over the connections. But as it turns out, I thought I was wrong, but I was mistaken. I did not need to do that, but I wasn't going to wind new coils, so I just left them at 18 turns. All right, it's time to make some measurements, and I do have a new toy here in the lab. I finally got a Nano VNA, and I've done the calibration beforehand, meaning I've used the, the short, the open, and the 50 ohm load, and I did the calibration at the end of the short piece of cable here. Set the frequency sweep from one megahertz to 30 megahertz, so I can look at the HF uh, the amateur HF band uh, frequency from lowest to, to highest, just a good standard range to check. And what I'm going to do first, I've got two loads here. I've got a 50 ohm load that I made up early in this project. Doesn't handle much power, but it's good for, for testing circuits. And then I made a, a, a moderately high power handling load. I wanted to get something that could take maybe up to 20, 25 watts in short duration at um, an SWR of 2.0, so I could get an idea of how well this antenna module would reflect um, the, uh, the modeling that I did. How well does a actual SWR mismatch correlate to the simulated? So a bunch of 47 ohm, two watt carbon comp resistors put together in, in an array such that I get 100 ohms nominal, and we'll see what that looks like. So like I said, I did the calibration already. I'm gonna zoom in now closer onto the nano screen and we can look at what the frequency response looks like for these two loads. If that looks good, then I'll proceed to look at what the response looks like with the antenna module in series. And no surprise, I'm looking at the reflection coefficient of minus 35 dB at one megahertz, and the SWR is 1.03, 1.035. Doesn't look like it increases much. It does increase a little bit, maybe because the leads on the resistors are starting to uh, act as inductors now because we're up around 30 megahertz, but either way the change is almost trivial. Uh, the reflection coefficient barely changed and so did the SWR. It's not 1.05. So that's good. Definitely usable. Now let me swap this out and I'll put on the 100 ohm load. And remember I need to uh, try to get to an SWR of about 2 and it looks like I'm pretty close. SWR is 1.96 at 30 megahertz. Return loss or reflection coefficient rather, negative 9.7 dB. And they're both pretty flat, just like it was for the 50 ohm load. 1.94 is the SWR down at 1 megahertz. So this looks good. I think this will work just fine to try to simulate an SWR of 2. For this next test, what I've done, I've connected the 50 ohm load up to the antenna connection on the antenna module, and I've got the nano connected up to the transmitter input. So essentially what's happening is, is here, the nano is gonna look at the reflection uh, coefficient and the SWR flowing through the entire circuit, and including, of course, I've got a dummy filter put in this place. This, this is just a direct short across there. So through that, through the relay, through the uh, directional coupler, and then down to the load to see what the total um, effect is of that entire chain. So I do have to power up the relay to turn it on to switch it so that it's in the circuit. So I'll do that now. And then we can take a look at the screen here. And it definitely has changed. It's not as flat of a line. There's definitely some dynamic uh, response happening here uh, around, what is that, around 3 megahertz or so, but it's still looking pretty decent. I mean, the SWR never gets more than, let's get out here to 30 megahertz, about 1.26 is what it's showing on screen there. So that's 
that's not as good as I would like, um, but I'm not sure what to do about it at the moment because it's the compound effect of how I have um, not just the circuit design, but how I have the circuit laid out, that there's, there's some uh, effects of the actual physical spacing of the coils, the traces on the board, and so on. But I think that's still usable. I think I'll just keep that in mind. I may even have to do like a compensation maybe at the higher frequencies because it's not as low as I would like. But again, I think I can still use it. Now I want to switch it over to this guy, to the 100 ohm load, and see what it looks like uh, for a SWR of 2. So let me turn the frequency marker back down low and swap out the loads here. Put this guy on. And I remember I'm trying to get an SWR of 2. So let's see what we got. So at one megahertz, I've got 1.94 and it gets lower. I should say it gets higher as I uh, switch out here. Nope, it's actually lower. I'm looking at the, the wrong value there. SWR 1.78, 1.77 at 30 megahertz. So again, not perfect, but as long as I keep that in mind of what my loads look like before I put any filtering in there and before I um, start looking at the output of the op amps and then trying to back calculate what the SWR is. It's good to know what an independent measurement is saying what the loads really look like. Okay I've changed the setup and what I've got configured I've got this big guy right here this is my Kenwood TS570S and the reason I drafted it into service is I want to be able to set various transmit power levels from 5 watts to 30 watts and then do it over three different frequencies 7 megahertz 14 and 21 and it's very easy to do that there's a menu setting on the Kenwood where you can set the power in 5 watt increments to whatever you want so got it set to 5 watts right now the rest of the setup uh, I've got my trusty Keithley and my equally trusty simple DMM back here these are monitoring the forward and reverse data signals coming out of the antenna module I did swap out the dummy load for um, a larger one. I should say the 50 ohm dummy load. The little tiny one I had, it's definitely not going to handle 30 watts. So this guy, you know, this guy's pretty big. It'll, it'll handle um, uh, 300 watts, no problem. And then, of course, I got this guy, too. This is the, the special made one for 100 watts, so I can check for an SWR of 2. Now you can see why I made this one a little beefier, because I want to be able to take some power up to about 30 watts, at least for a second or two, uh, and be able to, to collect some data and make a measurement. So the way I make a measurement, I set the power, like I said. Right now it's at 5 watts, and I will key on the transmitter for mo no more than about 2 seconds, just long enough so I can uh, get the readings back here on these 2 meters. And so like that, 700 millivolts, 51.5 millivolts, done. I repeat that test by changing the power level, I repeat it again by changing the transmit frequency, and repeat it again by swapping out this different uh, uh, load here. And of course this guy, I gotta be careful uh, not to put my hands on it and not near it because it's got RF energy and could potentially get an RF burn. So I set it kind of in the back of the uh, table so it was well away from me when I was doing the test. So I'll show on screen now the data that I collected. And this plot has solid lines that represent the 50 ohm load and dashed lines which represent the 100 ohm load. Now the target for the 50 ohm load was going to be around 1.1 to 1.2 SWR, again based upon the, the nano VNA measurements that I did. And that's the, that's the solid red line showing um, where that nominal should be. And you can see the data is pretty close, it's under reporting slightly. And then similarly, if we look at the 100 ohm load, that was my target of 2.0 for SWR, but again, back to the VNA measurements, it was showing it to be around 1.8 to 1.9, so I'm showing that uh, solid line to represent that, and you can see that that data is over-reporting slightly, but still pretty good. Now, if you break it down and do you know, uh, actual percent error analysis, I'm within about 10%, in most cases, I'm a little better than 10%. So, that's good. I'll take it. That is a win as far as I'm concerned with trying to estimate SWR. The last thing I want to show today is how I'm going to estimate the transmitted power, and that is really simple. I just take the, the V forward data value, I square and divide by a fixed coefficient. And referring back to the documentation for the Alex module, it states in there that that coefficient should be 0 0.09. However, that coefficient was based on a 20 to 1 terms ratio, 
Now, remember, I modified mine because I thought I made a mistake and I ended up leaving it at 18 to 1. So I need a slightly higher coefficient. And as it turns out, 0.1 seems to fit the data nicely. And here's what I mean. Here's a, a plot of the results from using that formula. The spread is pretty tight. And again, uh, within about 10% of the nominal value. Now, of course, I don't have a known accuracy measurement of the transmitted power. I'm only judging it by the setting on the Kenwood. But no worries. I think it's close enough, and I can always try to tweak it a bit more later. Of course, there are other methods to measure RF power and SWR, including things like a Bruni coupler. And you could even take the directional coupler output and feed it into log amplifiers like the AD8307 and get a more accurate reading of that forward and reflected power. But if you look at the price on that chip, it's up to about 17 bucks a piece now. So spending $35 on this project just to be able to get a slightly more accurate SWR and power reading didn't seem to match the budget at all. Meanwhile, I've been working on other aspects of this project, including finishing the remaining 3D printing, and I'm just about ready to start cutting metal on this case and stuffing the innards with all the circuit boards and getting the entire assembly put together, and of course the software to get that written and get the display put in, and a few other things to wrap up this pretty lengthy transmitter project that I've been working on. So I do thank you for sticking with me for these many months as I've worked on this and a few other projects. If you do have comments, leave them below. I'll be happy to read them. So until next time, bye for now.